Good evening. My name is Cliff Schaefer, and I am here to speak to you tonight about how to make the case for drug policy reform. This is something that is extremely difficult because the public mindset is so thoroughly against drug policy reform. They're so thoroughly in support of the drug war and so rapidly at times that <clears throat> it is often very difficult to get past the misconceptions, the prejudices, and the outright lies that have been told in the past in order to make the case properly for legalization or decriminalization. And what we are going to do tonight is we're going to take a look at some of the tactics and arguments that you can use to persuade people to support drug policy reform. And you'll notice I didn't say legalization or decriminalization, and there's a reason for that. The first, the first thing we should do when we try to make the case for legalization or decriminalization is we should do our homework, okay? That is, do the research necessary to get the facts so that you know what the facts are about drug policy. <clears throat> and there are a number of places you can go to get that information. The first place that I would recommend that you go is the Consumers Union Report on Licit and Illicit Drugs. This was a report which was done by the Consumers Union and the editors of Consumer Reports magazine in 1972. And that is probably the best written, most comprehensive review of the subject. It will give you a good insight into how the drug laws came to be and what the relative effects are of alcohol and tobacco as opposed to the illegal drugs. It has an awful lot of good background information and I highly recommend it to anybody. The next source of information I would recommend is the Drug Policy Foundation in Washington, D.C. They can be reached at 1-202-573-5005. And they put out a tremendous number of publications uh, with respect to drugs, a lot of good information, and they're doing a lot of good work. The next place you can call is the data center and clearinghouse for drugs and crime. This is a federal facility. It has an 800 number, and if you call them, you can get federal figures. They will send you all kinds of publications full of federal facts and figures, statistics on drugs and crime data. They also have a public bulletin board system if you happen to have a computer. And uh, they also provide a free research service where if you have specific questions that you want answered, they will help you find the information to answer those questions. They're a very good service. I highly recommend them. The first tactic <clears throat> that I would recommend that people do when they are arguing for drug policy reform is don't use the D word. <clears throat> and don't use the L word. What do I mean by this? What I mean is don't use the word decriminalization and don't use the word legalization. There's a very simple reason for this and that is that there are so many prejudices built up out there in the American public that if you say the word legalization or decriminalization you will just about set somebody's head on fire. After you say that word they won't hear a thing you say. So don't use that word. There are better ways to make the point. And besides that, I believe that our ultimate policy probably won't fit one of these nice little encapsulated words anyway, so they're probably inaccurate. The point, the major point that we should make when we are arguing about drug policy reform is that the issue is prison. The issue is not legalization. The issue is not decriminalization. Because we really don't know if we will ever do any of those things. The issue is whether we are going to put millions of people in prison. That is the issue. Don't defend legalization or decriminalization. Make your opponents defend prison because they can't defend prison. The next thing is, don't defend the use of drugs. Don't tell anybody that it is everyone's God-given right to put whatever they want to into their body. 
Now, you may be right, and I personally agree with you for a lot of reasons on this issue, but the fact is that a majority of the American public simply looks upon this as an excuse to get stoned, and in many cases, they're right. So don't defend the use of drugs. You don't need to defend the use of drugs to win the argument. Don't give your own plan for selling drugs. Don't come out with proposals that say, gee, this ought to be sold in uh, liquor stores at $2.50 a hit or whatever. <clears throat> There's a number of reasons for this. The first reason is, is that you're probably not right. There is no perfect plan for, for uh, selling drugs. There is no perfect solution. And therefore, any plan you give is going to be open to criticism and open to attack. It's just going to make you look foolish because anybody can knock holes in it. I can knock holes in any, any argument you make myself. The next thing you should remember is that judo is better than boxing. There are two ways that you can knock somebody down. You can use boxing, in which case you knock them down with your own weight. Or you can use judo, in which case you knock them down with theirs. In nearly all cases when you are trying to persuade somebody, it is better to knock them down with judo. In other words, use the arguments which they find persuasive. Use their own arguments against them. For example, if you run into a fundamentalist Christian, fundamentalist Christians generally believe that drugs are immoral and therefore they ought to be illegal. They won't hear anything you say on the subject unless they believe that Jesus would support what you are saying. That's just a fact. So use their own arguments against them. And the way I do it is this. is I say, you're a better Christian than I am, so you tell me. If Jesus came down here today and we gave him this problem, what do you think he would do? Would he build bigger prisons? Or would he build hospitals and schools? And of course, to anybody who's read the New Testament, the answer is obvious. Jesus was a healer. Jesus forgave people for their sins. And he restored them. And that's what we ought to be doing in society. The next point is build agreement. Find a common ground with a person you are discussing this with and start from that common ground. People will not believe you on any subject unless they believe that you share their same basic concerns and goals. For example, many people will say, I want to keep drugs away from kids. Well, so do I. But the current policy doesn't do that. So therefore, we better find a new policy. Or somebody might say, I want to stamp out drug abuse. They cannot stamp out drugs completely. We know that. So let's express it more in terms that both you and that other person can agree with. And tell them, for example, isn't what you really want to do is to reduce the harm done by drugs in any way we can? Naturally, they will agree. Once you've got them agreeing, salespeople know that if you can get somebody to agree that it's a nice day, they are more likely to agree with you later on down the line. So start from a common point of interest. Recognize that their goals for reducing the harm done by drugs are the same as yours. Start from that point of agreement and then bring them along slowly. The next point is win by inches. In other words, you don't need to convince people to support legalization or decriminalization in five minutes. All you really need to do is to convince them that prison is not a good idea, that prison is not a good approach to drug policy. And once you have convinced them of that, they will begin to ask their own questions. They will ask themselves, well, if prison is not the right approach, what is the right approach? And at that point, 
they will start thinking about it, and they will be going down the slippery slope to legalization. Because once you agree that prison is not the right approach, what else can we do? Well, we have to take a non-punitive approach to drugs. That's what we have to do. The next point <clears throat> is don't get tied up in debates over the health risks of drugs. There's a very simple reason for that. It is true that the majority, uh, the, the overwhelming weight of the medical evidence on drugs shows that the illegal drugs are not nearly as dangerous as either alcohol or tobacco. That's just a plain medical fact that anybody who's interested can go look up. But most people will find that very difficult to believe because they've been hearing propaganda for the last 75 years that heroin will kill everybody in America. So it will be very difficult to convince them suddenly that heroin is suddenly safe or marijuana is safe. They just don't want to believe it. Besides, the health risks are not the issue anyway. The issue really is, is that we could admit that anything we put into our bodies is likely to have some bad effect. You can eat too many McDonald's cheeseburgers and probably come down with a coronary. Anything is likely to have a bad effect. Drugs are likely to have bad effects just like anything else. But that's not the point. The point is, what is the best approach to these dangers? Just because something is dangerous doesn't automatically mean that the very best approach to those dangers is to throw millions of people in prison. One does not necessarily mean the other. And we can see some good examples with alcohol, tobacco, and AIDS. All of these things are dangerous. All of these things are major hazards to society. Alcohol and tobacco kill a hundred times as many people as all of the illegal drugs combined. But we would all recognize that it would be a big mistake to try to control the use of alcohol or tobacco by throwing millions of people in prison. We tried that once with alcohol. It didn't really work. We, we wound up re, uh, repealing the laws. So just because something is dangerous doesn't automatically mean that we need to throw millions of people in prison. We do need to do a little more thinking about it than that. The next thing is, don't get the issues stuck between you. Okay? As I said before, people will agree with you if they believe that you are their kind of person. Okay? So don't get wrapped up in one or more aspects of this issue on which you are absolutely polarized, where you've got one opinion, they've got another, and you just can't budge off of that. If you find somebody who's got an absolute ironclad opinion on something that just won't change, go around it. Hit them with another attack. Okay. The next, next item is, don't get stuck on questions which can't be answered. Congressman Charles Rangel of the uh, House Select Committee on Narcotics and Drug Abuse likes to ask people the question, well, how do we go about legalizing these drugs? Do we, open, do we, do we sell them in liquor stores, or what is it exactly we do? Well, Congressman Rangel is setting a trap, okay, because there is no right answer to the way to do that. There's only a uh, the lesser of multiple evils. We can make a choice, but it's only better than the other choices. It's not a perfect answer. No, no answer on this issue is perfect. So don't get stuck on these issues that, that can't be answered. Uh, if you find something like this which is leading you into a trap, avoid the trap. There are certain showstopper questions that you can ask that will absolutely bring the debate to a halt in a matter of minutes. Because the, uh, your opponent simply won't be able to give you a good, intelligent, reasonable answer that, <laughs> that does anything but look silly. One of these questions is, how many millions of people will have to go to prison in order to solve the problem this way? We already have a million people in prison. That didn't do the job. We have 30 million, 
uh, illegal drug users. So how many of these drug users are going to have to go to prison before we stamp out drugs? Is it going to be 5 million, 10 million, 20 million? What's the number? Now, whenever they give you a number, you can immediately knock them down. If it's a million, you can say, well, we've already done that and that didn't work, so we're going to have to do a lot more than a million. Okay? If it's 5 million or 10 million, then what you do is you simply take whatever number they have given you and you multiply that number times a half a million dollars because it costs a half a million dollars to put a person in prison to catch them, try them, convict them, and then put them in prison for five years. <clears throat> so if they recommend that we put 10 million people in prison, you multiply that times a half a million dollars and you tell them, well, the total cost of your plan is going to be five trillion dollars. That's trillion with a T. Okay? And at that point, you will have only put one out of three drug, drug users in the United States in prison. And therefore, you probably will not have solved the problem. You're probably going to have to go above 10 million. You're going to have to spend above five trillion dollars, which is more than our entire national debt at this point. Of course, <clears throat> That assumes that you don't spend any money else, on, any other money on anything at all. The next point is avoid complex arguments. <clears throat> One of the problems with the drug policy reform movement is that it is composed largely of intellectuals who like to make intellectual arguments. For example, they will make economic arguments that say that it's really economically better if we legalize drugs because of such and such a reason. Or they will make arguments about civil liberties and how we are losing our civil liberties. There's a basic problem with these arguments. The first basic problem is that our opponents are out there on TV frying eggs. The symbol of a frying egg is much more of a memorable event in people's minds than some complex argument on economics or civil liberties. And the fact is that most people really don't care about civil liberties or economic arguments, even if they could understand them. Um, I've seen uh, repeated surveys which say that uh, most people will refuse to sign the Bill of Rights because they think it's subversive. And there have been repeated surveys showing that up to 80% of the American public is willing to sacrifice their normal public freedoms uh, if it would help control the drug problem. Well, it wouldn't, but that's what they believe. The only people who are likely to be convinced by these arguments are the people who are already uh, convinced <clears throat> for our cause, and therefore these arguments are basically just pretty much preaching to the choir. When I say use simple arguments, I mean use real simple arguments. For example, the fact that two-thirds of all of today's black male teenagers will be dead, disabled, or in prison before their 30th birthday. You can say that in one breath. It is a point which gets everybody's attention. Everybody has to recognize this as a national disaster that we have to deal with. Okay? Keep it simple. Next point is stick to the issue. <clears throat> the problem with arguing drug legalization or the drug policy is that there are a large number of complex related issues. There's crime and prisons and welfare and employment and, and all of these other issues that are very closely connected with the drug issue. And it's real easy to kind of wander off into the mist and uh, get lost. And, and pretty soon you're not even arguing about drugs anymore. You're arguing about uh, whether we should reform our welfare policy. Well, we probably should, but that's not the point right now. So make it a point to stick to the issue. Don't get lost. Don't let anybody lead you off the track. The issue is prison. Are we going to put millions of people in prison? Two-thirds of those people are going to be black men. By the year 2000, we're going to have three million, three million people in prison. Two million of them are going to be black men. Do you think that's a good idea? It's as simple as that. 
Next point is get the facts out. When I say get the facts out, I mean, first of all, do the homework that I told you earlier, read these books. Uh, the Consumers Union Report on Licit and Illicit Drugs has a lot of really interesting facts about how the drug laws came to be, the racism behind them. Uh, they have a lot of interesting facts about uh, the, the uh, medical use of these drugs, the medical hazards of these drugs, and a lot of them are very, very, very surprising. For example, they have one chapter called How to Launch a Nationwide Drug Menace, which goes into great detail about how the glue sniffing craze was created in the early 1960s, primarily by campaigns against glue sniffing. Um, glue sniffing had never occurred to American teenagers before a newspaper published an article warning kids not to sniff glue. Well, what happens when you warn kids not to sniff glue? Well, you tell them that mama didn't want them to do it, it's dangerous and exciting. Well, wild horses aren't going to stop teenagers from doing it at that point. So it started a major epidemic. If you know these facts, you can really surprise a lot of people. If you know the racism behind the drug war, if you know the, the uses of hemp that most people are not familiar with, um, you can really surprise a lot of people, start opening their minds, and they'll start thinking about this. Next point is attack the foundations of the drug laws. Most people believe that we have the drug laws because they are necessary to protect public health and safety. Okay? That never was the case. The laws never were based on public health and safety. They were based on racism and ignorance and a totally distorted view of what drugs are all about. Okay? If people understand that the laws themselves came from an evil beginning, they will begin to question why we have these laws today. They never did make sense in the beginning. Nobody ever sat down and figured out that this is the right thing to do. Isn't it time that we thought about it now? <clears throat> there is one standard response I have found that you can give all the time that works for nearly any argument that the drug warriors might make. Okay? And that one standard response is this. There is no evidence to support what you say. In fact, every major study of the issue agreed that even if that was true, decriminalization would still be a better response. For example, somebody might say, if we legalize drugs, then everybody's going to become addicted. Okay? You say, there is no evidence to support that argument. In fact, Every major study of drug policy agreed that even if drug use did increase, decriminalization would still be a better response. And a matter of fact, if you look and read the materials I've presented, <clears throat> that is true of everything. Everything they say. There's not a single argument that that, that wouldn't work on. The next thing is preface your sentences. Okay? And that is use a phrase in front of your sentences every major study agreed for example every major study agreed that decriminalization would be a better approach than what we are doing now if you read the major studies you'll find out that nearly anything you say the studies agreed to the next is attack 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 okay you will not win the argument by defending legalization or decriminalization. You will win the argument by attacking the current policy and shaking their faith in what we are doing now. Once they understand that what we are doing now is not working, then they will begin to question it, then they will begin to ask their own, their own questions about it, and they will come around to your way of thinking almost without your help. Uh, for example, I need to tell an interesting story. Judge James Gray, who has come out for legalization, received a letter from a man, and it's, the letter started out very, very angry. 
The man was very angry with the judge for supporting legalization and started the letter by telling the judge how wrong he was. And then as he wrote the letter, it became clear to him that his own arguments were failing, that once he tried to support our current policy, he simply couldn't do it. And by the end of the letter, he wound up apologizing to Judge Gray and asking Judge Gray if there was anything he could do to support the, the call for reform. So attack the current policy. The next thing is keep it short and punching. Okay? Don't get long-winded. Don't get into a, a, a long series of explanations. If you ever get time on TV or television or, or radio, you will only get one or two minutes to tell everything there is to know about the subject. Keep it short and punching. The next thing is memorize what you want to say. There are many, many ways that you can fall into verbal traps when you are, when you are arguing this case. So get your arguments worked out word for word in advance and memorize exactly what it is you want to say so that your phrasing is correct and you don't find yourself falling into the trap of using the L word or the D word. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your patience and your time. I hope this helps. Thank you.